Well, hello, welcome to this episode of the Private Aviation Insider's Guide. I have finally cornered Joe Cirilli. He is a Lear 55 pilot and has had to reschedule with me a couple of times. And he has a fantastic reason for doing that because he flies organs. And he really has to be on call, ready to go at a moment's notice to save people's lives. Joe, thank you so much for joining the show today. I'm glad you're not having to save anyone's life today, <laughs> but we did have to reschedule this again for that on Saturday. So we did. Thanks. Well, thank you, Renee. I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. Well, I want to jump right in and talk about the suitability of the Lear 45 for this specific mission, because you're not the first pilot that I've talked to that uses an older Lear sure. for the mission of medevac. Sure. Well, the reason for that, Renee, is primarily driven by the fact that um, if you look at the airplane, and this is true of this is true of most of the uh, the older Lear jets, the 30 series airplanes, the 55. If you look at what those airplanes are are capable of, the performance of the airplane, and what the airplane really can do for you, do for you, um, and the, the mission profile that fits that airframe, at the price point that you can acquire these airplanes in today's market, there's really very few alternatives, if any alternatives, that will do what a Learjet will do uh, with that kind of performance for the same amount of money. And that's the reason why you, you predominantly see these airplanes being used. And, um, you know, we, we talk all the time about how Bill Lear probably never envisioned that his airplanes, you know, all these years later would be, would be you know, used for this purpose. Um, and it's remarkable how well they fit the mission, given the fact that they were really never intended to, to be used for that purpose. We don't fly air ambulances, per se. We don't have stretchers and oxygen and life support equipment. Uh, but I have many friends who do fly those airplanes, and they say that the, the Learjet is an excellent platform for that, which is a, a real testament to the airplane, given that it was never actually intended or built for that purpose. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of those performance specs. Can you tell me what the range is that you've experienced with the Lear 55, how fast it goes, what the ceiling is? Um, sure, so, so typically uh, the Lear 55 tends to, to follow the same mold of, of most of the Learjets of that era in the 30 series airplanes. Uh, the 55 in particular is certified to 51,000 feet. Um, I would, I, I've never actually met anyone that has had a Lear 55 to 51,000 feet. Uh, I wouldn't personally want to try to get it to go to 51,000 feet. And I, I'm, I can't imagine a particular set of circumstances where you could reasonably or legitimately get it to go that high. Um, on, on most trips, especially if you're carrying a lot of fuel and you're really trying to get the airplane to go far, um, unless it's very, very cold at altitude, it's a struggle to get it to go to 43. Um, so 51,000 feet is extraordinarily optimistic, but it's certified to 510. So at some point, somebody did it. Um, aside from that, the airplane has, uh, depending on, on obviously the winds and the conditions, the airplane has a zero wind range um, of somewhere, depending on how the airplane is configured, of somewhere between 1,800 and 2,200 nautical miles. There are a number of different uh, fuel tank configurations available uh, on the various different models. Um, there are four specific fuel configurations that I can think of off the top of my head. The only one I have experience with um, is the totally unmodified three tank fuel system, um, but there are uh, up to two additional tanks that you can add to the fuel system, but I have no experience with them in particular. And how fast do you fly it? So if we're, if we're not really trying to stretch the legs of the airplane, we typically fly the airplane at Mach 7.7. Uh, 7.7 tends to be a really good a really good sweet spot and a nice balance of performance and efficiency. Uh, you don't see a whole lot of, of tangible benefit in terms of time saved from flying it at 8.0 versus flying it at 7.7. Um, so 7.7 is kind of where we, where, we plan to, where we plan to be and where I like to fly the airplane. Um, if we're really trying to get the airplane to go far and we get it up high, uh, you'll have to fly it somewhere around 7.3, 7.4 to really stretch the legs. And what's the longest flight that you've taken? in the aircraft? The longest trip I have taken in the 55, um, we typically, if we're really trying to go far, we'll typically use the 35 for that trip. But on a, the, the longest I've had the 55 is probably Denver. Um, and I did not manage to pull it off nonstop. We, we, came, we came pretty close. Um, we were, we, I was kind of keeping an eye on, on what the conditions were like and and uh, with the headwind, we had about 115 knots of headwind for just about the entire trip. 
And uh, I pulled out every trick in the book and every trick I had up my sleeve to get the airplane to go far. And, uh, you know, the FMS was saying we were going to land with about 1,100 pounds of fuel, which, uh, you know, on a bright sunny day, that that's still cutting it a little bit close for me at 1,100 pounds. But, uh, you know, we just decided we'd stop for fuel. But, uh, but Denver is probably the furthest, the furthest away I've had the airplane. The airplane came home from Denver with absolutely no problem. And uh, if you take, you know, another, another 40 or 50 knots of headwind off, we probably would have made it with no trouble. Perfect. And for those people who don't know, uh, Joe flies this plane out of Teterboro. So going from New York to Denver, that's a long, long way for yes, sure. Yes, we are, we, are, we are based at Teterboro, which, is, uh, which, which certainly has its moments. <laughs> well, that's a crazy airport in normal times, although I'm hearing it the is. coronavirus shutdown sure uh, depleted the activity at that airport. It's, it's a sight to be seen. I've, I've never, uh, never seen anything quite like it, but I... Uh, you know, people ask me frequently what the experience of being based out of Teterboro is like, because just about everybody in this business has been to Teterboro, um, but uh, a relatively small proportion of those people are actually live there. And, uh, you know, I, I tell people I'm probably the worst one to ask because, because of our mission and the fact that we're always coming into Teterboro and leaving Teterboro as a medevac, um, I very rarely experience the, the 10 and 12 and 13 airplane stacks to, to wait for your turn to go. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, I've been based there for three years, but I'm not particularly used to having to wait in line at Teterboro. So I'm not the best person to describe the Teterboro experience. So you have the Disney World Fast Pass for private aviation. That's sure. nice. And it's, it's, uh, you know, I'm, we're spoiled on that regard for sure. For sure. But, uh, but it's definitely for a good reason because, you know, some, sometimes or most of the time on these trips, the, the, uh, the 20 or 30 minutes that we pick up trying to get out of Teterboro makes a world of difference. Yeah, absolutely. It could be a lifeline for someone. Sure. I'd love to know a little bit more about the actual operation of the airplane, because I know that you also fly a Phenom 300, which is a little bit more modern mm -hmm. aircraft. So I want to hear about how difficult it is to fly the 55 or are sure. there any special touches that you need to be a, a successful pilot of that aircraft? Sure. Well, uh, I don't fly the 300 anymore. Uh, I haven't I haven't been in a Phenom 300 in probably three and a half years. Um, they are two completely different airplanes and and two di two different eras, two different design philosophies. Um, and ultimately, uh, even if they were two newer airplanes, they fall into into two different categories. Um, you know, the Lear 55 has for most people a stand up cabin. Um, I'm I'm a little over six foot, and I just kind of have to tilt my head to the side a little bit to to stand up. Um, but it's a it's a bigger cabin in the 55, but they're two they're two completely different airplanes. The Phenom 300 is is by and large an easier airplane to fly, um, and I think the fact that it's it's an airplane with that much performance that is a single pilot certified airplane speaks to that. Um, the fact that you can have an airplane performs that well, and and the FAA said one guy's enough to fly it, that's that says a lot about the airplane. Um, the Lear 55, on the other hand, uh, also tends to kind of follow the the older Learjet philosophy. Uh, or, or uh, retain a lot of the characteristics of the older Learjets and that it's a little bit of a slippery airplane. Um, it's, it's, I tell people it's not a particularly challenging airplane to fly, um, it, but it's a very unforgiving airplane. Uh, and that's true of most of the older Learjets and even, even some of the newer models like the 60. Um, Explain so what it, you mean by that. Well, it's, it's an airplane that has, um, the runway performance is probably the number one uh, challenge with flying that airplane. It's extremely sensitive to runway performance. Um, the, the airplane uh, has, uh, requires long runways to get in and to get out. Um, and that's obviously amplified when the runway is wet or when the runway is contaminated. Um, so something, you know, a, a 5,000 foot runway on a Lear, with a Lear 55, uh, if you can make it work based on how the airplane is loaded, a 5,000 foot runway is probably the shortest runway I'd be comfortable taking a 55 to. Uh, the numbers the numbers will work and the numbers will let you do shorter runways. Uh, the book says that you can do shorter runways, but a uh, 5,000 foot runway is kind of the, the shortest runway for a 55 you can really be comfortable with. And that's assuming that the weather's good and the runway's dry. Um, so it's it's a little bit limited in that regard. And so that that adds to the challenge a little bit is that the the, the uh, takeoff and landing performance um, is is significantly uh, less than what I'd like it to be for an airplane that size. Um, there are many airplanes that are far larger that have far better runway performance than a Lear 55 does. And 
in uh, I, I would probably go so far as to say that of all the Lear jets built, um, the Lear 55 requires more runway than any of them um, in terms of in terms of runway performance. Now, in terms of the handling qualities of the airplane, when the airplane is at seven or eight thousand feet doing 250 knots, it is a, a an incredibly enjoyable airplane to fly. It has extraordinarily nice handling qualities. It's actually remarkably light in roll. Um, that was the first thing that surprised me the first time I ever flew it. Uh, I had been flying a Lear 35 for almost a year before I flew the 55 for the first time. And, you know, everybody always tells you that the 35 flies like a little fighter jet, and it does. Uh, but I was shocked when I got into an airplane that was 3,000 pounds heavier, uh, just a, a bigger Learjet. Uh, it's actually lighter and roll than the 30 series airplane is. So it's a very maneuverable airplane. It's very enjoyable to fly, but it flies very fast approach speeds. Um, it has very fast takeoff speeds. And the, uh, you know, like many of the older Learjets, the low speed handling qualities are virtually non-existent. So the, you know, it is a wing that was optimized to be a, you know, a high speed wing. And uh, it, it doesn't like to go slow. Um, you know, the, the expression in the Learjet community is speed is your friend. <laughs> and, uh, and you know that that is the case. The the limiting speed for the the uh, flaps 40 setting, which is our our full flap setting, is 150 knots. And typically at 145 knots, I'm calling for flaps 40. Um, you know, it's 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 not a low speed go slow kind of airplane. So it's it's not a particularly challenging airplane to fly, but it's not forgiving uh, in any way, shape, or form. It needs to be it needs to be flown from the moment you you get in the airplane to the moment you get out of it. You can't, not an airplane that you can let, let get away from you because it'll take every chance you get. I don't think I've ever heard it described exactly like that, but I think that's a perfect explanation for what I've heard other pilots say about the Lear series of aircraft. Thank you so much for explaining that to me. Sure. Yeah, they're so, a lot of fun, but you got, you got to stay on top of them. So how's the pilot workload in the cockpit as you're taking off and you're, you're landing in the Lear 55? Well, the, the workload, um, obviously in, in any airplane, those are going to be your two, your two highest workload periods. Uh, in the Learjet, the, uh, any additional workload that comes from it being a Learjet or being a Lear 55 uh, would come from the fact that the airplane is just a very minimally automated airplane. Um, you know, the, the Lear 55s were all delivered with the Jet FC 550 autopilot, um, which is a slightly improved variant of the FC 530 autopilot that was offered in the uh, later model 35 airplanes. Uh, and it's a very capable autopilot if you, if you keep it in perspective. If you, if you look at autopilots from, from that era, it's a very capable autopilot. Um, I have three years with that autopilot, and I have nothing bad to say about it. Uh, you know, it's it's not going to do any of the the fancy new stuff that we're used to now, like you know, coupled VNAV and and things like that. But it does have altitude preselect, and uh, you know, it does have nav capture and and uh, LRN hold, and that's all great. But it's a it's a fairly basic autopilot. So beyond that autopilot, the airplane is really not an automated airplane. Um, with that being said, the systems are actually fairly straightforward. It does not have a whole lot of complicated systems. So the workload in the, in the takeoff and landing phase of the flight um, is primarily generated by the fact that, uh, you know, things happen very, very quickly. Um, you know, the, the, the V1 and VR speeds are very high in the 55. Even when the airplane is light, they're pretty high. Um, when the airplane gets heavier, you can get rotation speeds above 140 knots. Um, so the, you know, it's, it's a fast moving airplane. It takes it quite a while to get to 140 knots, but um, things happen pretty quickly and there's very little automation there. So, um, you know, having, having a really competent FO in the right seat makes life a lot easier, but, uh, it's, it's a challenging airplane, uh, probably more than anything else because it's not very automated. Okay, perfect. Well, tell me how comfortable it is to sit in the cockpit as a pilot. Yeah. I, well, I compare it to, um, I compare it to the 35 because the, uh, you know, those are the two airplanes I fly the most. It is, it is a world more comfortable than flying the 30 series or the 20 series airplanes. Um, you know, the, the cockpit of the 30 series airplane was a mild improvement over the cockpit of the 20 series airplane. And when they built the 55, the idea was really to just build an airplane that retained all of the qualities or as many of the qualities as possible from the 35, but offer a bigger cabin. Um, and that's really what the 55 is. So the cockpit is, is much roomier. It's much more comfortable. Uh, it's, it still has a few Learjet limitations. Um, for me personally, like I said, I'm a little over six feet tall. And when I get the seat just right in the cockpit, 
I have maybe an inch of clearance from the headliner. But uh, in every other aspect, it's got a lot of elbow room, a lot of leg room. It's a much more comfortable airplane to be in for four hours than the, uh, the 30 series airplane is. Um, and it has a few other creature comforts that, that make it a more comfortable Learjet for pilots. Um, it has a separate, um, a, a, well, not entirely separate air conditioning system, but it has a, a partially separate air conditioning system for the cockpit, which the, uh, the 30 series airplanes do not have. So the cockpit of the 55 stays much cooler in the summertime than the, the 30 series airplane does. Um, that's a really nice creature comfort for us. And uh, it's, it's definitely a, a roomier airplane than, the, than the, its predecessor. So I say, you know, if I have to sit in it for four or five hours, I'd rather be in the 55. Obviously. Well, I know you talked about this a little bit before about the stand up or almost stand up cabin. And I was in a 55 a couple weeks ago and noticed that myself, um, even wearing low heels was able to do sure. the same thing. Uh, tell me about the rest of the passenger experience, what you've heard from the doctors you've been flying around sure. or some of the business charters you've been on. Sure. Passengers love the airplane. Passengers absolutely love the airplane, uh, especially um, the doctors that we fly. Uh, you know, we get to know a lot of them. Um, it, it's frequently the same, the same doctors. So we uh, we know most of them and they know us and uh, they know the airplanes. So they, they love both airplanes. They like the amenities in both airplanes, but uh, you cannot deny the additional room of the Lear 55. Um, so the passengers really like the airplanes. The Lear 55 has a true lav, an actual enclosed lav, and the 35 has more of a makeshift lavatory. Uh, so the, the actual stand-up lav with a running water sink, uh, passengers certainly enjoy that. Uh, it's a much easier airplane to load baggage into. So in general, the, the cabin is very well received by, by clients and, and by our doctors. They like the airplane. Well, I was going to move to baggage next. So let's talk <laughs> about how much you can carry and where you load that in. So the, the uh, 55 holds, uh, has a number of baggage compartments, three in particular. The, the largest of the three is in the main cabin, um, which is one of the, the trademarks, so to speak, of the Learjet product line, um, specifically the earlier airplanes. Uh, the baggage compartment was always in the very back of the cabin behind the passenger seating area. Um, and the same is true of the 55. So the majority of the large luggage uh, goes in the cabin baggage compartment. Now the uh, emergency exit window on a 55 actually by design doubles as the baggage door. So to load the baggage, typically you would have, um, you know, one of your, one of your, your team members or line service staff bring the baggage over to the right side of the airplane. And uh, from there, you have to pick the bags up twice. So you pick it up twice, you put it down once. It gets picked up to go to the wing, and then it gets picked up to go through the emergency exit, and then it gets put down into the baggage compartment from there. Um, but it is far easier than having to bring it in the, the cabin entrance and, and drag it all the way to the back of the cabin, uh, which is the only way you could do it in the earlier airplanes. So that's the largest compartment on the airplane. There is a nose baggage compartment, uh, which is a relatively small, we, we don't, that's the last place we actually put bags. Um, that's kind of, think of that as overflow baggage if we really need to put bags somewhere. Uh, typically we use that for the uh, AOG supplies for the airplane. So we'll keep our engine covers, our pitot tube covers, um, and, and some small, you know, maintenance items, paper towels, press, things like that. Um, we'll really use that for the items that kind of support the airplane. Uh, and there is an aft external baggage compartment under the left engine. Uh, neither one of those baggage compartments are pressurized. The aft compartment is heated. Uh, but not pressurized. And normally uh, we put the crew luggage in the external aft compartment and that way we leave all of that space in the cabin open for the passenger bags. That's so great. Wonderful. Tell me about flying organs. I mean, this is a really unusual it is. cargo. What, it is. what kind of, what kind of measures do you have to take to make sure that the this obviously precious cargo gets there the way that it's supposed to. Well, the uh, I, as far as special measures or or in, in that context, uh, very few. Um, to be completely honest with you, the you know when we when we um, when I get a phone call for a trip like that, I I brief that trip and and file the flight plans and start putting the logistics together for that trip exactly the way I would for a retail trip. They typically tend to be on much shorter notice than retail trips. So at the shortest, maybe two hours from the phone call to wheels up. Um, at, the lo at the longest, maybe 12 or 14 hours notice. So it can be anywhere in between. Um, but once, the, once the, uh, the passengers or the doctors show up at the airplane, 
from then on out, it really, it really becomes a passenger charter. Um, you know, we load the, the cooler and their supplies into the airplane and all the equipment that they're going to need. And then we board them and, uh, you know, they get the exact same treatment that uh, any of our other clients would. We try to make the ride as enjoyable for them as we can. Uh, we try to, we try to, you know, make it a good experience for them. And uh, they have a, they, they certainly enjoy doing it. I know we enjoy doing it. All of the pilots in our company, you know, really enjoy the mission. And, uh, you know, from that standpoint, the, uh, the speed of the jet is really what makes it happen. Um, you know, 500 miles an hour is what gets that done. So uh, from an operational standpoint, I really don't view it any differently than I view any other trip, aside from being on a medevac call sign and uh, air traffic control, you know, helping us out or giving us a shortcut where they can and trying to get us in quick, which I, I got to hand it out to all of the air traffic controllers that, that, you know, work these medevac airplanes. They really do go out of their way to, to try and shorten the trip up for us when they can. Um, especially the controllers at Teterboro are excellent with that for us. Um, you know, they do an excellent job. And uh, the rest of the magic is, is all the doctors. I mean, they're doing, they're doing an incredible, incredible thing. And uh, we're just trying to, to get them safely from A to B and make it an enjoyable experience. And in many ways, I think that as, as a pilot in command in an operation like that, that's kind of the way you need to look at it. So I've never, um, you know, I, I certainly don't waste any time getting done what needs to get done. But once the door closes and, and we get ready to go, I treat that trip as any other trip. Um, you know, I don't, I don't uh, do anything differently than I would flying uh, any other kind of mission. Um, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't let what's in the back of the airplane get inside my head because I don't want to, don't want to operate the airplane any differently or, or view any situations like weather, performance, anything differently than I would just because we're a medevac. So, um, so that's kind of the way I look at it personally. I think that's the way most of most of the pilots that do this uh, kind of look at it. Once the door closes, it's 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 any other trip. Well, it's such an important mission, always important to have your airplane ready to go and well-maintained, which Absolutely. leads me to ask you about any maintenance issues, kind of chronic maintenance issues on the Lear 55. And I don't know how much you're involved in the direct operating costs or, or the maintenance costs of the 55, but sure. obviously they're getting a, a little bit long in the tooth and they are need some things, uh, extra things done. So anything you can talk to you about that would be great. So these airplanes, these airplanes provided that they are, that they're properly maintained um, and they're being maintained by people that really know the airplane and know what they're looking at. Uh, these airplanes, the dispatch reliability and the dispatch rate on these airplanes is, um, is, is equal to anything of the air. Um, you know, it, when we start talking about airplanes that are 30 and 35 years old, um, I would say that there is not another 30 or 35 year old uh, jet out there with a dispatch rate any better. Um, you know, we obviously, you know, we have a, an in-house maintenance department that are always putting eyes on the airplanes and, uh, you know, they take excellent care of our airplanes. Um, so, so, you know, our airplanes have been fantastic for us from a maintenance standpoint. Obviously, you know, they are airplanes and they are 35 years old. So from time to time, things do break. Um, the thrust reversers in particular are something on the 55 that you really need uh, somebody in your maintenance department that really understands that system to maintain that system. The uh, Lear 55 in particular was only offered with two tailpipe configurations. So they either have Aranka thrust reversers or they have no thrust reversers. They were never offered with the D Howard thrust reversers that the 30 series airplanes were. So the, the Aranka thrust reversers are pneumatic TRs. So they are air actuated. They're actuated by bleed air servos, um, which makes them a little bit unique. And they just require a little bit of extra lubrication, a little bit of extra maintenance to keep them operating. If they're being maintained on an ongoing basis, they, uh, they're incredibly reliable and, and they work. I mean, they're extremely effective, uh, which I think is not something you can say about every thrust reverser configuration on a jet. Typically, uh, the overwhelming majority of your stopping performance is coming from your brakes. Uh, on, a, on a Learjet with Aronka thrust reversers, uh, when they come out, they come out, and they really work very well. I would say you could stop a Lear 55 in under uh, under 4,000 feet or 3,500 feet, even with just the thrust reversers. So um, they're they're a real asset to the airplane to keeping the runway performance manageable. Um, and uh, as long as you have somebody working on them and looking at them that really understands the system, they're very reliable. But um, typically, when you hear about operators talking about how they they don't particularly care for the Aranka TR and they've had reliability problems. That's not so much an issue with the design of the TR as it is with as it is with who's putting eyes on the system. Very good to know. That's the first time I've heard that at all. Sure. Very yeah, the, the, the Ronkas are great, but they but you need to you need to know what you're looking at when you work on them. So, in 
closing this part of the interview, I want to know what you think is the greatest strength and the biggest weakness of the Lear 55 overall. I would say that the the greatest strength of the 55 is the passenger appeal. I think that I think that it's it is a an airplane like like I said is very well received by passengers. It's got a fantastic cabin. It's got great amenities for the passengers. It's got a a, a very large refreshment center, a true lab that's enclosed. Um, unfortunately, it's not an externally serviced lavatory, but from a passenger standpoint, that makes no difference. Uh, but it's it's a good lab from a passenger standpoint. The cabin is fantastic. And quite frankly, I think you'd be hard pressed to find an airplane at the current price point of Lear 55s that delivers a better cabin for the money. Um, that, would, that would be a challenge, especially in that, in that general class of the airplane. I would say that the weakest, the weakest trait or characteristic of the 55, and I come back to this again, is the runway performance. It's just, it's an airplane that, uh, you know, there are a few airports that we, we tend to frequent a few times a year as part of the medevacs that have certain hospitals that are close to those airports. And uh, a few of them have runways that are under 5,000 feet. And it's just not, it's not a trip we can really do with that airplane. Um, you know, if it's close by and the weather's really good and we can make it work, then from time to time, the 55 can do that. But it's not an airplane. If I, if I had the need to regularly operate out of 4,000 foot runways, it's the wrong airplane for that kind of mission. Um, that's by far the limiting factor. And it's not, it's not a matter of, you know, the, the takeoff performance, is kind of weak or the landing performance is weak they're both weak so they fixed part of that when they built the 60 and they put you know far more powerful engines on the airplane and you know the 60 still requires quite quite a bit of runway to get stopped but it's never a problem getting it out um the 55 has both small brakes and small engines so it's it's uh, needs a lot of runway to stop and it needs a lot of runway to get going um i think the the i i brought the airplane home from denver uh maybe two years ago we left Denver at, at 10, or, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. It was maybe 85 degrees out, and we had enough fuel to come all the way back to Teterboro. And I want to say our, our balanced field length, uh, when we ran the data, our balanced field length was uh, over 9,000 feet. Um, so it, it's, it's an airplane that requires a lot of runway. I was going through uh, the performance tables with a new first officer recently that uh, we'd hired not too long ago, and... Uh, he actually pointed out something that, that I had never noticed because I'd never had a reason to go to that part of the chart. But he said, hey, you know, if we take this airplane to a 5,000 foot elevation and it's 90 degrees out and we load it up as heavy as it can possibly be at that, at that temperature, we need 12,400 feet of runway. And I said, well, you're never going to take the airplane to, you know, you're never going to find yourself in that situation. But in theory, yes. So if you, if you, Take it out to the extreme on the charts. There are published balance field links that are over 12,000 feet for the airplane. <laughs> so, Unbelievable. Well, that yeah, is super, super helpful. Joe, thanks so much for sharing all this information about that. Hey, you're very welcome.